Discover how the samurai also perfected a new way of making superior swords. Learn the samurai's deadly secret to sword fighting. See their ingenious approach to armor. And enter a samurai castle designed to confuse and foil attackers. Secrets of the Samurai, next on Discover Magazine. It was an age when brother turned on brother and father turned on son. It was the age of the samurai. In Japan from the 12th to 16th centuries, power lay in the hands of warlords who carved the country into small fiefdoms. Each lord maintained his own army of samurai warriors who battle to expand their domain. But the samurai were not just warriors. They also created stunning fusions of technology and art. What are the keys to samurai science? The secrets of their swords, castles, armor, and martial arts. Samurai swordsmiths perfected a technology that few have ever matched. Their swords sliced cleanly through limbs. The samurai treated their blades with reverence. Some swords, they believed, had personalities of their own. Saratoshi Gassan's family first began forging swords in the 13th century. It's scary how much of the swordsmith's personality appears as the sword is created. Not only do you have to polish your craft, but also your personality, because it too will appear in the sword. An evil sword maker would create an evil blade. So swordsmiths could only be men of the highest morals. These craftsmen faced an ancient dilemma. A sword must be hard enough to hold a sharp edge, but soft and flexible enough to absorb blows without breaking. Japanese sword makers were among the first to solve this dilemma, creating a blade that was both sharp and resilient. And they did it over 800 years ago. Their secret lay in their extraordinary ability to combine steels of different hardnesses. The swordsmith begins by making an extremely hard steel. Its hardness depends on its carbon content, which the master controls through hammering. He pounds and pounds until the carbon level is just right. Then he folds the steel. Each fold doubles the number of layers. Over a dozen folds create thousands of paper-thin layers in the metal. This hard steel will become the keen cutting edge. Next, he makes a softer, lower carbon steel. Now he joins the two together. The softer metal in the middle becomes the flexible core, while around it, he wraps the hard steel that can hold a razor-sharp edge.
this is the breakthrough that made Japanese swords superior to all others. Hammering gradually draws the metals out into a single long blade. But he's not finished yet. Now the swordsmith takes the most difficult and magical step of all. He hardens the metal, fusing the steels together. He must raise the temperature of the entire blade to over 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit, judging only by its hue in his darkened forge. The very last moment takes the most concentration. Is it going to be a good sword or a bad sword? Everything will be determined at this point. Now he will plunge the blade into cool water. If he miscalculates and it's not at the right temperature, it will warp as soon as it hits the water. He will lose weeks or months of work. As the two steels cool, they contract at different rates, giving the sword its characteristic curved shape. It's a success. The sword made the samurai feared and famous. It weighed less than three pounds, about the same as a European blade. But its cutting edge was harder and sharper. It easily sliced through torsos and sent heads tumbling. Coming up, battle techniques revealed the ancient art of samurai sword fighting. Here at Kashima Grand Shrine, one of Japan's oldest religious sites, samurai have studied martial arts since the 1200s. Carl Friday, a historian of Japanese martial arts, studies the ancient sword fighting technique called Kashima Shindyu. European swordsmanship, particularly into the early modern era, tended to focus more and more on uh, straight thrusting type attacks done with relatively light and straight weapons. Japanese swordsmanship focuses mostly on big slashing motions, slicing at the opponent. Students use traditional wood swords for practice. The Kashima School teaches students to always keep the blade moving. Sword moves in circles all the time, right? So that, that there's no break in momentum. If you're moving up and down in, in straight motions, you have to stop the sword and then start it again and then stop it again between each move, and that takes extra time and energy. Samurais so honed their technique that fights usually ended in just a few moves almost as quickly as a pistol duel. The slightest misstep was fatal. They learned to move in and out of striking range, to read eye and body language. But the real secret of the Kashima school was learning to make the first move. The uh, key point in this technique is that I'm drawing him out, I'm stepping in, throwing the sword in his face, and forcing a response on his part. I put him on the defensive. His response in this case is to attempt to sweep my sword out of the way and then attack my head. But instead of letting him do that, as he starts to sweep, I slip out of the way and cut him instead. If you act first, you can anticipate your opponent's response. And at the moment he thinks he's won, turn the tables. 
It was the samurai swordman's tactical brilliance that made him so deadly. Like a chess player, he always thought several moves ahead. A samurai learned hundreds of combinations of moves and trained relentlessly until his lessons became second nature and his mind, body, and sword moved as one. In battle, the samurai wore armor of ingenious design. While Europeans made armor from metal, the samurai took a radically different approach. They designed a composite material. It was woven from leather, iron, bamboo, and silk. Although it was no lighter than chain mail, it was more flexible. So flexible that samurai wore it not only in sword fights, but in unarmed combat. Masami Ozawa at the Tokyo National Museum has mastered the secrets of making samurai armor. Japanese armor is made for ease of movement, so it fits loosely on the body. A suit like this one, made for a high-ranking warrior, was expensive. It took over a year to make. And in today's currency, cost tens of thousands of dollars. These small plates, made of tough rawhide, are the armor's building blocks. The samurai's armor maker cuts holes for stitching and painstakingly smooths each plate out. He lacquers each piece. Then he stitches them together using flexible lacing made from monkey skin. Each plate overlaps the next to create a flexible panel. First, you make the panels. Then once they're lacquered, you sew them into the suit. These overlapping shields help cushion a sword's blow. The flexible panels bent with the blade's impact, dissipating the sword's energy. Next, discover the combination of beauty and strategic brilliance inside a samurai castle. In the mid-1500s, a samurai warlord bought a new weapon from Portuguese traders. He turned it over to his master swordsmiths. And within 50 years, the Japanese were making more guns than any country in Europe. This was the most violent period of samurai warfare. Rival warlords fought each other with armies of up to 60,000 warriors, including thousands of gunners. for samurai to build hundreds of large, strong castles. And none chose the brilliance of the samurai's master builders as clearly as Himeji Castle, built by one of the country's most powerful warlords. Tens of thousands of laborers toiled for over a decade to complete it. chisels and cutting tools were made with the same metalworking technology sword makers employed. The 
Real Samurai's carpenters used no nails to hold their structures together. Instead, they devised intricate interlocking joints that kept even massive beams in place. Their tools included over 40 planes of different shapes and sizes, and dozens of saws, chisels, and hammers. They would spend up to a third of each day sharpening their tools. This maintained the sharp edges they needed to cut softer woods. But it was also a kind of meditation that rid extraneous thoughts from the mind. Carpentry was more than just a manual trade. It was a religion. It's like the one-stroke swordsman. In the same way as the samurai would pull his sword to kill an enemy, the carpenter who used his plane blade had to be able to get it right in one go. Carpenters did use nails to fasten floorboards and roof tiles. And in Nijo Castle in Kyoto, they used them in a creative design to protect its warlord. These are the nightingale floors. An assassin trying to slip through the hallways could not tread silently. The carpenter's secret lay in the method they used to fasten the floorboards. They connected each board to the joist beneath it by a metal bracket and nails. With each step, the boards rose and fell slightly, rubbing the nails and brackets together and creating the nightingale sound. Himeji was protected by other defenses, typical of Japanese castles, but more elaborate here than anywhere else. At its heart stood a fortified tower, the defender's last citadel. Around it lay a series of walls and gatehouses designed to confuse and trap attackers. This is just the inner fortress. Beyond it lay residences for over 3,000 samurai, enclosed by two more moats and outer walls. Craftsmen erected the outer walls with a brilliant system of masonry. On top of the stones, carpenters constructed shorter wood walls covered with white plaster to resist bullets and flaming arrows. Attackers could enter only by storming a gatehouse. The entrance to the castle was protected by an elaborate series of gatehouses of varied and ingenious design. And in this case, you had to actually go up the hill that you see here, turn at right angles, and you would then come under sustained fire from the samurai who were in the turrets above the gatehouse, in the walls beside it, and on each side as well. Warriors who broke through the inner compound's first gate would have found themselves facing yet another gate, and then another. And attackers who found their way through would be sitting ducks. This is where it became even harder for the attacker. While still climbing up these steps, they had to go around this wall 180 degrees, up the path, and then find that they were confronted with yet another gatehouse. Attackers who made it this far would believe they were close, but they'd be wrong. They'd have to enter over eight more gates, following a winding path three times longer than the straight distance to the tower. Troops who finally reached the central tower would still have to storm a building as heavily fortified as it was beautiful. The Great Keep was 150 feet high, it had a timber structure weighing over 5,000 tons, and it was one of the most impressive and largest buildings constructed before the 20th century in Japan. This building served as the final fortress and command center. Defenders had clear shots from its barred windows and could
could hurl stones and boiling water down on attackers who tried to scale its walls. Inside, the samurai kept enough food and arms to withstand a long siege. And the Lord would command the battle from the very top floor. Wide windows gave him a clear view of the battle below. And if the castle was about to fall, here the Lord would commit seppaku, ritual suicide ending his life with honor. By then, the tower itself would likely be in flames. Although many Japanese castles were destroyed in battle, the formidable Hameji was never once attacked. Perhaps because no one who saw it could imagine it was possible to take. In the 1600s, the age of samurai warfare finally came to an end. With the help of the gun, one warlord, Tokugawa Ieyasu, defeated all his rivals. The country was finally unified and at peace. The samurai would fight no more wars. But the samurai sciences live on. The samurai believed that striving for perfection could lead to something higher. Today's practitioners strive for the same perfection and enlightenment. Channel, explore your world.